The most terrifying thing happened to me earlier. I don't fully understand it, but I am freaking the hell out. Please don't read on if you're not into scary things. This is both graphic and frightening. It's also a pretty long story. So I've talked about how much I love my house. I bought it this summer. It's in the woods of Connecticut, tucked in the crook of two lakes. I'm closer to a boat launch than a grocery store and see about five to six deer a day when I go for my run. Quiet and serene. Or so I thought. It's also very dark at night. Like when the lights in my bedroom are out, it's so dark that my eyes simply don't adjust, no matter how long I've been in the room, until dawn. I have motion sensor lights right outside my bedroom window, so when a deer wanders by, usually going to headbutt the bird seed out of the feeder, it triggers the light. Scared that shit out of me the first time I noticed it. I was awakened in the middle of the night, opened my eyes to this usually pitch black room flooded with a dim light from the windows. I leaned over to look out, and I could see their eyes glowing back at me, just beyond the reach of the light. Stupid deer. But anyway, back to tonight. I finished editing the Adweek Daily newsletter and went for a later run than usual. The neighborhood I live in is solidly middle class, but if you follow the main road past it, it becomes a steep, winding route down the hillside, thickly forested and without houses, before you reach a private community full of starter mansions. I like to run this route because traffic is infrequent, the hill is a nice challenge, the forest makes me feel all druidic and wild, and when I reach the bottom, I get a nice view of the rich people's private harbor. About halfway down the hill, despite the lack of houses for at least a half mile on either side, there's this weirdly sinister beat up gate with police line tape. I've noticed it before, but didn't think much of it until today. Here's me headed down that hill this evening, which I've done dozens of times, taking a silly photo to send to my husband, and then the second one, which I didn't particularly mean to take. Because when I took that photo, I had just heard a desperate, gut-wrenching scream. The scream had come from beyond that gate, apparently just beyond my view at the top of the hill. It sounded like it belonged to an adult man, and it was pleading for help. Oh god, help! Please, someone help! And so on, before it descended into a deep, guttering groan. The scream fell silent. I stood there, in the grass by the fence, rooted by that chilling appeal. Had I imagined it? No. No way. I closed the camera and opened the phone app. That person sounded seriously hurt, but I didn't know what I was getting into, so I thought I'd dial 911 while I was checking on them to see if I could help. But I had absolutely no signal. Not unusual out here. I tried the SOS function, but that wasn't working either. The sounds were still coming from over the hill. Pleas for help, punctuated by horrible, racking sobs. I called out, Hey, are you okay? Do you need help? Pretty stupid. They had just said they needed help. And <laughs> I didn't really want to know the answer. My voice came out small and reedy, but despite our apparent distance, they heard it. The response was immediate. Please, please help. No, no, no. They groaned again, and I heard something else beyond their voice, something I couldn't place. Leaves rustling? It sounded wet. My heart hammering in my chest, I fidgeted nervously for a minute, considered running for a house, but knew it would be a long time before I returned. Maybe I could assess the situation and then go get someone. Maybe there would be better signal at the top of the hill. I squeezed around the gate. I'm coming, I called. Just hang on. The leaves dampened my shoes as I trekked up the hill, and I slipped slightly as it steepened. At the crest was a rocky outcrop, and as I rounded it, I found a stone staircase arcing up farther to the right. It's hard to explain, but these stairs didn't look like they belonged there. A trick of the light made them seem sort of copy and pasted onto the hillside? The shadows were all wrong. I took a quick photo, but now there's just a black photo in my library where it should be. But either way, the stone was solid beneath my feet, so I proceeded up their curving length, about seven long, shallow steps that rounded the rock. At the top I saw... nothing. Well, that's not true. I saw what you'd expect. Trees, ferns, bushes, rocks, a blanket of fallen leaves obscuring the forest floor in a small clearing. 
I couldn't see any houses through the surrounding foliage. It was quiet. Very quiet. The man's pleading voice had faded away as I climbed the stairs. The birds, the wind, had gone silent. I could see the yellowing leaves fluttering on the branches above me, but their sound was muted. I felt as if I had entered a snow globe. I scanned the clearing, and in a small voice that sounded distant to my own ears said, Hello? Are you alright? In that moment, it hit me like the heat of a blast furnace, a wave of horrendous stench, reeking rot, decay, death. It lit my nerves on fire. It weakened my knees. I gagged and doubled over to wretch. That's when I saw something I can't fully explain. Something unlike anything I've ever seen before. Between two trees, watching me. It was more or less humanoid, but completely unlike a human in every way. Two heads taller than me, impossibly thin, no clothing. Corpse pallid skin stretched over a fleshless ribcage. Jutting hip and shoulders affixed to elongated limbs with knotted joints. Distressingly long hands ending in spidery hands with long, broken, yellowed nails. But I noticed two other things about it before that. First, its face. Hairless, noseless, with bulging, dead eyes. Blank globes as pale as those of deep sea creatures. And its jaw. It dangled, slack and loose, almost to its sternum. It was horrible. That wide, gruesome mouth, the gaping, tongueless hole, a gory red-black, seeming to extend into unfathomable depths, edged with long, crooked, yellowing incisors. The jaws stretched wide, intensifying the stench, and thrust its head forward as if to roar. But instead of a roar, that dreadfully desperate voice, the one I heard from the road, emerged from the depths. Please, no, please, someone help me, help. Help me. The other sound was unmistakable now, also emerging from the cavernous maw. It was sound of wet flesh and muscle being torn and gnawed and slurped, the crunch of bone, punctuating the agonized screams of the victim to which it belonged. The creature took another step, and then another, staggering pace quickening as it advanced upon me, heart hammering, a rushing in my eyes. I realized I had been standing still, and I needed to get the fuck away. I reeled and made to run, and stopped short as, to my utter, unmitigated horror, I found myself face to face with another one. This one taller, yet more bent, more skeletal, close enough that I could see what looked like age spots clustered on its cadaverous skin, close enough to touch me, close enough to feel its hot breath that stank like a mountain of corpses under a hot sun. It stretched its ghastly, pendulous jaw, blank eyes bulging in its gaunt, noseless skull, and a gut-wrenching scream lanced through the silence. This time I heard a woman, screaming in agony, punctuated by that same stomach-turning gnawing sound, all from that cavern of a mouth. Desperate to evade the creature before me, yet cognizant of the hastening from behind, I stumbled to the right, felt my shoe catch on a rock and sprawled into the wet leaves hitting the ground hard and leaving a skidding furrow in the leafy coating of the forest floor. I rolled over, and they were there, the one closest to me once again face to face with me while the other towered above, looking over its companion's shoulder at me, both still emitting that horrible cries of what I can only assume were their prior victims. As the stench of their breath washed over me, a crippling misery took hold of my mind, driving everything else, the despair of people I had never met, who knew they were about to suffer grisly fates carried out by clammy, spidery fingers, crooked teeth, and crushing, sucking maws. I felt pressure. Those bony fingers were groping, prying pressure, trying to dig through my jacket into me. I ineffectually struggled to push them away, feeling a dreamlike weakness as the creature prodded at my gut. Suddenly, terror seared white-hot in me, and I thrashed. My foot caught it just below its prominent ribcage, right in what should have been its gut. The wailing cries were cut short as it recoiled for a moment, its jaw flexing, a low death rattle guttering from its throat. This was my moment. I scrambled backward in the wet leaves and was halted when a long, clammy hand gripped my ankle. I kicked and flailed desperately. The other ones were coming around on my right. I thought of my dogs and my husband. I scrambled in the leaves, helplessly gripping at the soil. My fingers grazed a rock. I seized it and flung it gracelessly at the thing holding my ankle. It struck right between its awful dead eyes, and that shittering crescendo to a screech. 
but it released my ankle. I turned over, got a foot under me, found another rock, stood and flung it at the other one. This one barely grazed it, but it halted, and I took that moment to pelt back down the hill, only to find out too late that the stairs I had climbed were gone. Instead, the earth dropped steeply down in front of me, a charge down the slope anyway, losing my footing, sliding down the wet, leaf-slicked hill, tripping to land hard on my hands and knees. But when I looked up, I saw the metal gate ahead of me. I heard sodden leaves rustling, rattles punctuated by screams behind me, and that was all the motivation I needed to bolt to my feet and out onto the road and back up the hill. It was a mile back to my house, and I think I broke a personal record getting there. My husband thought I'd been chased by an animal or fallen off a cliff, with my hair and clothes caked in mud and leaves, pale and panting. I had trouble explaining what happened to him, and wrote this to help myself work it out. Honestly, I'm questioning everything. Fuck. Am I losing it? That can't have been real. I went to bed early, thinking only my dogs and blankets could make me feel safe. I'm in my bedroom now, typing this insanely long thread. The motion activated lights just switched on outside my bedroom window. I don't think those eyes of the darkness belong to deer anymore. Wow. I had no idea this would take off. Thanks so much for your concern. Everyone. I'm still here and as of yet intact, though still pretty freaked out. And the problem isn't exactly solved. Last night was interesting. When the motion sensor light tripped and I saw the eyes, I yelled for my husband, Drew, who clearly thought I had lost my mind when I came home shaking and covered in leaves. Of course, by the time he got to the room and looked out, the eyes were gone. I thought this stuff only happened in movies. He told me it was probably just more deer. I knew it wasn't. Those eyes were pale, massive, softly glowing yet so, so empty, and it took so much effort to look away. But, given that I was clearly upset, he agreed to come to bed early with me. In the middle of the night, I woke up. The room flooded with light again from the motion sensor. I sat bolt upright, hissed Drew's name, then rolled over to look out the window beside the headboard, and found myself looking directly at one of them. It was right there, crouching to peer in the window through the gap between the blinds and window frame, dead eyes fixed on me, that empty, endless mouth dangling open, twitching slightly. I swear I could hear its low, rattling breath. I let out a strangled cry and scrambled back, tangled in the sheets. Drew was awake at this point and, thank God, looked over at the window and finally saw it too. What the, he said, as I dragged him toward the door by the arm. My big mutt ranger came to the rescue. He's a massive black shepherd mix. He seriously looks like Batman. And he surged up from his bed on the floor with the most intimidating sound I've ever heard him make. A mix between a snarl and a huge booming bark. Ranger charged at the window, put his paws up on the sill and began to bark. Viciously. Furiously, saliva flying from his bared teeth, hackles high and bristling. He's such a softy normally. I've never seen or heard him do anything like that before, but he looked ready to kill. The thing outside the window recoiled. Now I'm sure I could hear its alarmed, chittering screech as it staggered away into the darkness. Another one that had been lingering just at the edge of the light lurching after it. Needless to say, Ranger is getting lots of love and treats today, though he won't stop staring out the window. Any thoughts on what I should do next? People have been calling these Wendigos, Skinwalkers, not deer, but I'm not sure. I am not an artist, so hopefully this doesn't look too silly, but this is more or less what they looked like. Thank you all again for the recommendations, identification, theories, and support surrounding my, er, screaming creature situation. I have a few developments on this situation from yesterday and today, though I don't know exactly how satisfying it'll be. In the light of day, Drew told me in no uncertain terms that he thought I was pretty idiotic for following the voice up the hill, past a private property sign and police tape in the first place. Which is completely fair. But also, I'm not sure I entirely had a choice. Like, I did want to help the person, but I also felt compelled to. Same with the stairs. I felt like something was lulling me, luring me up them. But that's neither here nor there. We have an immediate problem. They came back last night. That's at least two nights in a row, and I'm guessing they won't just stop. That is, I'm pretty certain they came back. Something did. I didn't actually have the courage to look. I didn't see them at all during the day yesterday. 
The first time I saw them on Monday, they were active during daylight, albeit in the evening. I suspect they don't leave their territory, i.e. the area behind the police line gate, except at night. I know these things are afraid of Ranger, so I've been taking him with me, on leash, when I walk around the property. This video is from yesterday, taken after I posted the update. That window is right by the headboard on the side of the bed where I sleep. I don't know if you can see in this area, see those spots where the dirt's churned up. And then uh, that's the window that they were looking in. Um, and you can see how tall they are based on that. Huh. I don't know if you can quite see this on camera, but the leaves are kind of churned up. I'm sure it'll be covered up by the end of today. I assume they're specifically after me because I invaded their territory, but obviously I don't want to risk them hurting Drew or the animals either. So we're trying to figure out how to get them to leave us alone and be prepared if slash when they come back. I love my new house, damn it, and I'm not letting these twitchy assholes ruin it for me. I'm still not sure exactly what we're dealing with. Lots of people have suggested wendigos, skinwalkers, mimics, not steer, etc. I read up on everything mentioned yesterday. Lots of similarities here and there, but differences too. They could, of course, be a variety of one of those cryptids, but I'm tempted to use a distinct name for them. Pointless, maybe. My first instinct, naturally, was to take an etymological root and call them osteoglots, with Greek elements meaning bony and mouth. In response, Drew told me I was such a dork. And considering his dyslexia, he said they needed a simpler name he could pronounce and remember more easily. Fair. We discussed hollows, devourers, lurchers, gorgers, and gulpers. Open to alternatives. As for the individuals, I'm pretty sure I've only seen two. So the more upright looking younger, one I'm calling Tantalus, and the other, which is taller but more stooped and age spotted, is Pharynx. Yesterday I went with a mixed bag of recommendations for precautions and protection. I sprinkled salt along the window sills and at outer door frames. I wanted to make a boundary around the whole house, but A, I don't have that much salt, and B, this week has been and continues to be rainy, so I think it would wash away. At hashtag HeyAlexa's recommendation, I got my silverware, a big box of actual silver cutlery. I put some by the window and doors, but maybe I should hang them up? Not sure how effective a salad fork would be against those things. I could use that silver dish somehow? I have some silver necklaces as well, so we've been wearing those. And this iron rose with a sharp spike on it that Drew had a blacksmith make for me at a Ren fair? Can't hurt, right? I didn't have any sage to burn, but I'm going to try to get some at Chai Thukrol's recommendation. Some people suggested calling the police to ask about the police line tape in the woods, but I'm hesitant to do that because the gate has a mangled private property sign on it as well, so I don't exactly want to confess to literal trespassing. Earlier, I saw my neighbours were home-based on the smoke from their chimney. They've had a fire going every day for the past couple of weeks. Even though it's been pretty warm. Actually, all of my neighbours have. Anyway, I went over and did my best to not sound completely unhinged when I asked them if they've seen anything strange the past two days. It was very warm in the house, and I noticed their two outdoor cats were indoors, sitting at the windowsill by a jar filled with big coins. Beth, the lady's name is Beth, said she hadn't seen anything, but she said it in a strange way, her voice oddly flat. She stared at me hard while she said it. I asked if she was sure. I'm sure I haven't seen anything, Beth said, her tone blunt, almost angry. It took me aback. She's usually very friendly. But you know, she continued with less intensity, there are all sorts of things out here at night this time of year. She paused for a moment. I try not to look outside too much. Beth has to know something. But when I asked her what sorts of things she was worried about, she brushed off the question. Oh, you know, animals and things. It's the season for it. She clearly wasn't going to fess up. But I suspected I knew what those and things were. When I made to leave, she told me to stay warm and asked if I needed any firewood. It was almost 70 out, so I declined. Plus, we have loads of it. She can literally see it from our house. You have that fireplace. You should use it, she insisted. Are they afraid of fire? We slept, uh, tried to sleep, in the basement last night. 
it only has tiny windows, ones they could never fit through. The lurcher things felt pretty solid and apparently applies to them. I drew the shades down, salted the window sill, and put some silver spoons along the edge. I'm certain the lurchers were outside around 2am though, because Ranger and Ladybird started barking like mad near the windows. I could feel them, I think, choking dread welled within me, lingering for an hour. I couldn't work up the courage to look out, and begged Drew not to. Neither Drew nor I could sleep after that. We watched Great British Bake Off and played video games to stay calm. I tried to work on my next etymology book, but couldn't get much done. Today, I'm totally exhausted. I can't just keep hiding, but I don't have any ideas for what to do differently tonight. I'm going to look into missing people at Eric Doster's recommendation, then try to sleep better, again in the basement, and work on this with a clear head. One thing that's especially worrying me, I really don't think I should have drawn the one that I showed you yesterday. I think that was a mistake. See, I was getting some work for Ad Week done today, went to jot down a note in my notebook that I always keep next to my laptop, and suddenly I realized I had been drawing it again. And again. And again. And again. The motion activated lights just came on again. That bigger dot of light is from my neighbor's porch in the distance. But the other two? There are just trees and bushes there. Another update. It's been a better day. I've learned some things, made some progress, put away my notebooks and pens in the bottom of the closet so I can't draw anymore. Ripped up those pages. I tried to take everyone's advice and start a fire last night, but it turns out my chimney needs servicing. The damper is stuck. Even Drew couldn't get it open. Most of our firewood was pretty wet too, so it may not have lit. Call the chimney guy, he'll be here on Wednesday. In the meantime, candles. Candles on the windowsills, a candle next to me, while one of us is awake for safety. Drew and I took turns sleeping. Thank God my bestie, Emily Hightower, sends me her homemade candles all the time. I have a bunch. And they smell amazing. The candles suddenly made my space feel like home again. It's such a relief to have their warmth all around. I've also been carrying a lighter with me when I take the dogs out. It feels so tiny in the big endless blackness, but it's there, and it's bright, and chases away a bit of that cold, helpless terror I've been living with for days. Plus, I think it worked. I did see that one lurcher that I showed you last night, but it was definitely keeping its distance. It was definitely watching me, but I don't think either of them got close to the windows like they did before. Unfortunately, I have determined that the camera that came with my house is well and truly deceased. The darn thing won't even turn on. Plus, if the neighbors know about these things, as I suspect, they clearly haven't captured or at least publicized video of them either. Maybe there's a reason for that. In any case, I have ordered another camera, just because I'd like to have one, but it's also coming next week. Biggest development. I've been digging into the history of Candlewood Lake. The lurchers were close to Candlewood Shore when I first encountered them, and they appeared to be coming from the Candlewood side of my house when they visit. It's very pretty in the daylight. I took this last week. Not in my neighborhood, but not too far away. It just shows a small segment of the extensive, complexly shaped lake. The lurchers' territory by the fence is about a half mile northwest from this vantage point. Candlewood is a massive, human-made lake. The largest in CT, Created in 1928 through the construction of several enormous dams and pumps. Huge projects, requiring 1,400 workers over a few years. My former colleague and friend Eric Doster is correct. There was a lot of history there, including towns and former Native American lands bought, stolen, for ridiculously low sums by European colonizers that were flooded when the lake was created. There was a town called Jerusalem, located in the red circle on the map, in what is now the lake. Some residents sold their land to the developers behind the project. Others refused. I can't find any information on what happened to them. Maybe they were forcibly evacuated. Workers also had to dig up and rebury the bodies in Jerusalem's graveyard. One article said laborers were paid $1 per corpse they moved. The creation of the lake began in late February of 1928, and it took a mere seven months for the lake to be born on September 28th of the same year. Uh, according to the Candlewood Lake Authority. So, a month over 94 years ago. 
Over the following months, many things washed ashore, including remnants from prior Native American residents. Countless arrowheads as well as spearheads, mallets, war axes, adzes, bits of pottery and other implements washed ashore or unearthed during early excavations. As for the people I heard screaming, I found stories about missing persons in my area who could fit the bill. I don't want to go into too much detail because they might reveal my house's location beyond the fact that it's close to Candlewood. As it happens, a lot of people have died in the bodies of water surrounding my house, and not just Candlewood. Like, a disproportionate amount for your average lake. Some are out swimming or boating and drown. Others are reported missing and then found. Presumed drowned. Of course, the people I heard screaming from the lurchers didn't sound like they were drowning, but maybe drowning was simply blamed for their deaths? Maybe a lot of these drowned people simply had some of their remains discarded in the lake by the lurchers after they... finished with them. Still can't get that awful, wet, gnawing, crunching sound out of my head. Then again, these creatures could also live primarily in the lake for all I know. I only felt their skin briefly when the one grabbed my ankle, those horrible, grasping hands but it was cold, so cold, like a corpse bloated from a night in chill water. Another interesting tidbit I found, colonizers learned of and began to emulate a Native American substitute for wax candles made by splitting the inner core of pine logs, filled with pitch and turpentine, into narrow eight inch strips which burned like small torches. The best pine for this candlewood was plentiful on the mountain, dominating the northern horizon of the present lake, and it came to be known as Candlewood Mountain. This is also what gave the lake its name. Could there be a connection between this candlewood and the fact that the monsters, presumably, don't like fire? Also, remember when I told you that my neighbor had coins in her window? I remembered that I found a box of coins in the crawl space in my wine cellar when I moved in. I'm not sure if it's a counting thing or if it's a silver thing. Don't half dollars contain silver? I have this uh, wine cellar in my house, and at the back, I don't know if you can see that door. Um, it's just like a little crawl space, sort of a, a Harry Potter closet. But in it, I found this, and uh, it has a bunch of half dollars and a silver spoon in it. Um, obviously it's bent, I don't know why. But don't these things contain a little bit of like actual silver? Um, I don't know what this means, but um, I think it belonged to the previous owners. I know this hasn't been very creepy, so I hope it's not disappointing for people who are here for a scary story. But there was one slightly creepy thing that did happen last night. I sleepwalked, which is very unusual for me. I've occasionally murmured in my sleep, but I've never been much of a somnambulist. But last night when we were in the basement around 1.30am, having gone downstairs after I showed you the photo of the yard, I had dozed off, and Drew said I got up and walked across the room. He said Ranger got upset and followed me, nudging me with his nose. He has herding breeds in him. So he does that when he wants you to go somewhere, like to his food bowl. But Drew said I brushed past him and went up the stairs to the front door, landing, and reached for the handle. I had been having a dream. I didn't actually see anything, just blackness. But I felt so cold, so alone, and I was sure something was watching me. Silence pressed in, yet I could hear something in the distance, something I wanted to hear better, but I didn't want to go to Ward. I was so confused when I woke up, the door handle still in my hand, the door opened a crack, letting in a blast of chilly air, which, now that I think about it, was odd, because it wasn't supposed to be cold last night. All I knew was that I had no idea how I'd gotten there. Drew was yelling my name, yelling at me to wake up pulling me away from the door and slamming it, and I was so tired from the previous nights and stressed from everything else that I just dissolved into tears. I hope I can figure out more tomorrow and get them to leave us alone. I'm sorry. I'm not quite ready to talk about what happened last night, and I'm terrified. I'm piecing things together and will hopefully update tomorrow when I feel more... myself. I don't know what I'm going to do. Why does the night have to be so deep? Okay, it's a bright, sunny fall day. Feeling alright. A lot has happened. Two nights have passed since I last updated. The lurchers have continued to linger around the property. I think I saw an additional one or two hanging around on Thursday night, but they didn't get closer. The reason I've been having trouble writing about this is because the sleepwalking and those terrible dreams continued. 
Thursday night, after I updated you, I got up again and did the same thing. Walked to the front door and made to open it. Drew stopped me again. I'm tired. But last night was worse. I was alone. Drew was laid off earlier this month and just got a new job offer. The onboarding for the new gig involved a two-day training in Massachusetts. Two nights away. I desperately didn't want him to go, and he didn't want to leave me alone either, but we need him to keep this job, and there are monsters outside my house. Didn't seem like a practical excuse to skip the onboarding. I would have just gone with him, but I didn't want to leave the dogs or cat, and our boarding place was booked up. We talked about calling in a sitter, but for all I know, that would put her in danger. He left mid-morning, and I spent the day jumpy as hell. I got through my ad week work just fine, but the smallest sounds, the neighbor chopping wood outside, a truck delivering a package, my cat chasing a leaf, made me jump, sweaty, and shaky. As a precaution, before Drew left, he helped me figure out how to basically belt my wrist to my bed and move furniture to the exits. I didn't fight back when he tried to stop me, and I woke up easily, so we figured undoing a belt or moving furniture would do the same thing. We were wrong. Night fell. I was cuddling the pets on the sofa in the basement, eating some popcorn, editing the draft of my etymology book with Great British Bake Off on the TV in the background, because it's happy and the scariest part about it is Noel Fielding. The evening felt almost normal. Then I dozed off. I didn't mean to. I don't usually just drop off to sleep sitting up, but I haven't had much sleep and suddenly I was just... The chill blackness pressed in around me, a deep, endless, lonely dark. Palable silence broke again by something just beyond my hearing. I drifted toward it, dread roiling in my gut because I knew that the vague, garbled thrum would coalesce into an all-too-familiar death rattle. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted out. I wanted to go back. I turned, I fled, but found myself moving toward it once again. It was all around me. They were all around me. It was so cold. A sharp pain in my right foot awakened me with a start. I had tripped, scraping my bare toes on... Oh, shit! I had stubbed my toes on the curb outside the gate. I was there, at the side of the road, halfway down the hill where I first heard those harrowing screams. And I could hear them again. Please, please help. No, no, no. A deep moan carrying down the hill. I stood in the grass by the pavement in the deep dark of night, shivering in my leggings and tank top, a cloud-blackened sky melding with the dark canopy above me. There was zero way I was going to go past that gate again. I had no shoes. My feet ached, roughened and raw from the long walk here that I couldn't remember. I had no phone, no light, no one to hear me call for help. I had to get to a house. Any house. Uphill was best, back toward my house, away from the lake. I turned and stepped back onto the pavement to head that way, and saw one of them watching me from the opposite side of the road. Icy terror seized me. It clambered, jerking and twisting its neck, its mouth open and rattling, up the roadside slope on all fours, then stood up to its full height as it approached the road. It was Tantalus. I was sure. The first one I had ever seen. I ran. Up the hill I dashed, no longer cognizant of the ache in my feet, driven only by an animal instinct to escape the predator pursuing me. The hill was steep, so steep, but I flew until another lurcher stepped out of the trees and onto the road ahead. I halted, breath coming in painful, cloudy gasps. It was less than two meters away. Another emerged from the trees on the other side of the road opposite its companion. There were three of them? And I don't think either of these two were pharynx. One was quite a bit smaller, more crooked, its dangling jaw twitching as it chittered at me. The other was the palest I've seen yet. Its corpse-like skin seemed to glow almost as white as its eyes in the darkness. Which means that there are at least four of them. Oh. Hell. No. Going around them wasn't an option. The trees were thick on either side, the hill sloping sharply upward on one side and sharply downward on the other. Besides, what if there were even more lurking there, waiting for me? The pale one closest to me took a staggering step forward, jaw swinging, as it unleashed a scream from its yawning maw. Another human scream, one I hadn't heard before, this one wordless, raw, ripping from the creature's throat as it had ripped from someone else's. That was all the prompting I needed. I turned again, pelted down the hill. Normally I'm pretty careful about how I run down the hill because it's very steep and my knees are very thirty, but this time I pelted down it and felt nothing but the thudding of my own heart. 
Tantalus was ahead of me, now in the middle of the road. But the road was wide here, and I wasn't going to stop to let the two behind me catch up, so I zagged sharply to the left, away from the gate to dash past the lurcher. It lunged for me, impossibly long fingers on impossibly long hands, and long bony arms coming all too close as it shrieked in the man's agonized voice, garbled with that wet flesh ripping sound I had heard before. I flinched away, dipping to a crouch to avoid its grasping fingers without stopping, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but as I straightened and continued, I turned my head and screamed back at it, a nonsensical roar of terror and adrenaline. And I may be making this up, but I think it looked surprised for the brief moment I bothered to look. Well, that's good. I could confuse them for a second, I thought. I wonder if they have a sense of humor, came the giddy, illogical panic, a thought as I charged onward, and I laughed aloud, a shrill, unpleasant thing to my own ears. The road arced down the slope before me, long and blessedly empty, but dark. So dark. Behind me, I heard bursts of screams and rattling, grating growls, and to my dismay, the same sounds and the crunch of leaves churned by long legs and fleshless feet in the woods to my left. I sped up and rounded the corner at the bottom of the hill, laying eyes on the blessed lights of one of the enormous estate-like houses along the shore of Candlewood Lake. I could see it still, mirror-black lake beyond the house. I charged ahead onto the expansive grassy lawn. I would run to the door, throw myself against it and bang on it with my fists, and scream until someone woke up and let me in, and failing that I'd break a window with a rock and climb in. Prison is better than death, right? But I never got there because from the bushes emerged yet another lurcher staggering into my path. I whirled, seeing the others approaching from behind, spreading out around me with their crooked gait. I screamed for help, but I was still so far away from the darkened house. Why did these damn properties have to be so big? Besides, I couldn't see any cars outside. So for all I knew, it was only occupied seasonally, like many of the houses by the lake. I had nowhere to go. The lurchers were advancing, closing the distance between us. I realized with a sinking dread that they were hurting me, and it was pretty obvious where we were going. I retreated in the only direction I could, toward that black, smooth surface. I was still ten yards away from it, in the grassy tree-dotted span between two of those gigantic houses. Beside the lake, I could see the grass end at a carefully manicured, rocky beach of sorts begin. The water stretched away, glassy, black, no moon or stars in its surface. What to do? I had no interest in going toward the water. They were forming an arc around me, seven, eight of them closing in, driving me toward the water. Screams bursting, alternately from their gaping throats, the rattle from the others crescendoing, pressing in. I could try to run between them, but those long, grasping fingers would surely catch me. It was over. I had to choose how I would die. I don't know how she knew I was there, or where she came from. She seemed to appear out of nowhere behind them. One torch, and then another bursting to glowing orange flames in her hands. They illuminated a woman's unruly grey mane of hair, her gnarled tree root face, her dark simple jacket and jeans. Tiny, bent and furious, she shouted unintelligibly as she brandished her torches at the lurchers, slashing the air with them. They shrieked and chittered, recoiling from the flames. Their semicircle around me parted, making her way for her. She turned as she moved toward me. Back! Back! Away, you filth! She spat, shrieking as her torches blazed bright and warm. They obeyed, shuffling back from where we now both stood. Th thank you, I managed to say, my teeth chattering, heart still pounding, breath still coming fast. Stupid! She spat back at me over her shoulder, shooting me a venomous look. Stupid, stupid girl! I gaped at her. Don't just stand there, she ordered. I heard a hint of an accent. Maybe Dutch? Take one of these. She thrust a torch at me, and despite being taken aback at her tone, I accepted it gratefully. It was a bundle of sticks, tied with twine and with some sort of dark, viscous material coating the top of the sticks, keeping it alight. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. The woman thrust her free hand into a fanny pack. Yes, a fanny pack. At her waist, I withdrew a handful of coins, which she scattered in the grass before the lurchers to our right. One of them cocked its head, bending over to examine them. Come! Hurry! She seized my non-torch-bearing wrist and dragged me back the way she came. The lurchers lingered, rattling softly, just beyond the reach of the light, their glowing eyes upon us as I hurried with her back across the lawn and up the hill. Aren't we going to go back to your house? I asked, gesturing at the big house across the lawn. Eh? 
She glanced at it, then barked a cheerless laugh. That's not my house. Some rich asshole lives there, and probably only in the summer. Come, back to your house. You, uh, know where I live? She walked quickly despite her bent frame, and in my bare feet it was all I could do to keep up with her, praying my torch would stay alight. I do, she said. Hard not to with those Verschrickengen watching you every night. Ver... what? I asked. What do you call them? She asked sharply. Lurchers, I said. She grunted. Lurchers, then. They have been hunting you, calling you. I glanced behind us, seeing two of them following us up the road at a distance. I assumed the rest were nearby beyond my field of view. Do you know why? Probably because you followed their screams like the damn fool you are. I couldn't argue with that. So you know about these things? Yes, she said shortly. But now is not the time. Keep moving. The adrenaline was wearing off. I was so tired, but she kept our pace strong all the way back to the house. She barged in, through the unlocked front door, which I had apparently unbarred by moving my grandfather's chimney cabinet out of the way. Thanks, I gasped, winded. You saved my life. Yes, I did, she said, thrusting her still-burning torch at me, locking the door and moving the cabinet back in front of it. This lady didn't look like much, but she was strong as an ox. What's your name? I asked, gripping the torches and staring at her. Joanna. But this thread is more than enough for one day, and Drew just pulled in the driveway. I'm gonna go catch him, him up and explain why there's an angry little old lady putting torches on stakes in our front yard. I'll catch you up on the rest tomorrow. I... we have a plan now. I don't like it, not even a little bit, but it's a plan. Continuing from yesterday. On Friday, or really the wee hours of Saturday morning, after we had made the long trek back to my house, me shivering, hobbling painfully alongside Joanna on my worn feet, her towing me mercilessly after her, the wiry little woman stayed overnight. Ranger and Ladybird, who like strangers but usually bark when they first arrive, treated her like she had lived there her entire life. Joanna, who was adamant about not identifying herself beyond her first name, relit the candles I had out and placed the still smoldering torches in mason jars on the front porch and by the back door. She didn't seem concerned about the fire hazard. She helped me tend to my scuffed feet, cursing my stupidity all the while. In the light, her hair was a shock of grey, her face thin, brown, twisted in a permanent scowl. I was both intimidated and in complete awe. I was seated at my dining room table, one foot propped on her knee while she ungently cleaned the sole muttering a constant stream of insults and curses, and I tried to question her about the lurchers. Idiot. Adelpated. Useless. She snarled. Yes, okay, I agree, but... Just like all the others. Wait, what? Others? I asked. She harumphed, seized my other already tended foot, and produced a length of thin rope from her fanny pack, which upon second glance proved to be more of an adapted leather pouch on a belt that was fanny pack shaped. Realizing with a flash of panic that she intended to tie my ankles together, I protested, but she demanded venomously whether I wanted to go sleepwalking again. And I fell silent and let her do it. She didn't tie them tightly, just a couple of loops with a firm knot between them, enough to make walking impossible without landing flat on my face. This way, if you try to get up, you'll just fall over. It would certainly do that. Abruptly, she got up and strode straight out the front door. Don't move. She ordered, slamming the door behind her. Entirely nonplussed, I waited, stroking Rangers' ears, googling people in my area named Joanna. I found nothing promising. After half an hour, I began to wonder if she was coming back. But just as I did, she barged back in, hauling a waxed canvas log carrier stuffed more of those wood bundles in a battered paint can. She dropped both unceremoniously beside me, produced a pair of work gloves from the log carrier, and tossed them at me. She opened the paint can, which contained not quite a liquid, but gummy blobs of something yellowish. Take some pitch, put it on the bundle, like this. She withdrew up a bit of what I now understood to be pine pitch, with her gnarled fingers and deftly worked it into the ends of the sticks, which looked like she had frayed them with a knife. We got to work, of course with her constantly criticizing my clumsy method while she churned out more. Did you just go home? I asked when she had run out of faults to find. Do you live nearby? Nosy. Mind your own business. Heaven knows you have plenty of it. After a moment, she said, You should put that phone away when you're a wandering girl. You never know what it will see you cannot 
or what it won't. She paused. Besides, it is rude to video people's houses. I'm pretty careful not to capture any houses in my videos of trees and animals, so this was confusing. Then I remembered. I pulled off the gloves and produced my phone. I took a picture of a shack on a dirt road about a 15 minute walk from my house a couple of weeks ago. I showed her. You live here? I take no judgment from you, little rabbit. She snapped. That epithet was pretty rich coming from a lady who looked away half what I do, but thought better of saying so because she was also correct. Stupid, stupid, she muttered again. What are they? I asked abruptly. The lurchers. You're not supposed to talk about them, you fool girl, she snapped. You'll call them right to you. At first I thought she wouldn't answer as she continued to work on her torch. Finally she spoke, her tone softer now. This land is old. Old. They are older than much that grows and walks upon it, creatures of the deep earth. They were guardians of the land, born of clay and the stone. The first people learned quickly not to go doing anything that would awaken them, bring them to the surface. They learned to use the fire to keep them within their subterranean realm, for they despised the heat as they do direct sunlight. But then more people came. They thought they knew better, thought they could command the land, a land older than their own kind. They thought they could tame it, change it. These fools took blades to the earth. They carved it. They gored it. They marred and scarred its face. Most did not respect or even believe in these... lurchers, as you call them. Did not take the proper precautions. Some did. Some realized what was happening. But they thought they could wash it away. The Candlewood Lake Project, I said. She made a noise I interpreted as assent, then continued. The project was already planned. But it needn't have been so vast, so convoluted. It needn't have swallowed Jerusalem, but for what lived in the cavern surrounding it. They spilled the river's blood upon the lurchers. Land, she said bitterly. Just a month after they declared this monstrosity complete, right on schedule, the creatures that had been resting peacefully in the chasms of the earth arose from the depths to claim what was owed to them. Every year they come back, and they will until they deem the price has been paid for the ruined earth. Something flashed across my mind. Vision, dreamlike, of the lurchers striding out of the lake. Why do they want me? I asked. You waltz right into their trap, you damned fool. She snapped, sharp again, brandished the torch at me furiously. I flinched, illogically thinking she might throw it at me. And then you proceeded to bait them and disgust them and photograph them and whatever else you're doing on that black brick of yours. Well, usually they take a swimmer or a boater, if they can, if they're allowed to. She murmured, eyes unfocusing. She paused, then she shook her head. But the rain last week, it kept people off the lake. This time they chose you, alone in the woods. They like the wanderers, the ones who roam and seek the small corners of the earth. Not everyone is so lucky as you, she continued. I didn't feel very lucky, but all right. I don't always get to them in time. You were lucky your friend warned me. Huh? My friend? She gestured to the eastern end of the house. You mean Beth? I said, understanding. Beth told you about me? She humped in apparent assent. The ones who know. This time of year, they burn their fallen pine branches. They don't talk about them. They have learned. So what do I do? I asked. Can I get them to leave me alone? There is a way. She replied quietly. You will have to go face them. And you must learn to control the dreams quickly. Control the dreams? You dream of the lake. You dream of walking, offering yourself to them. The frigid blackness pressing in. How do I control it? Joanna stayed the night. And last night, too. Drew got home yesterday evening, and he's not pleased with the bossy, homeless-looking lady in our house, but isn't pushing it because he's just as lost for next steps as I am. She gave him jobs, too. Putting more torches on sticks, surrounding the house with them, cleaning out a bucket from the garage. My job was to practice, with Joanna coaching me. We turned off the lights, the only illumination coming from the flickering torches outside, and I sat on the floor, cross-legged, eyes closed. I am terrible at meditation. My mind is a busy, scattered place, and clearing it is a challenge. I was shouted at and upbraided over and over again. But eventually, after hours of effort, I was able to lower myself into the blackness of the water on command. I could feel myself drifting within its chill depths, see the endless blackness around me. I awakened with a start. I was on my feet, and my cheek stung as Joanna Tree emits another wave of verbal abuse. I realized she had slapped me awake as I stood to sleepwalk. Again, 
she snarled, dragging me back to the center of the room, where I sat again and tried again. Four more tries later, I was growing frustrated, and my face hurt, red from repeated slaps. She threw her hands up and stormed off, cursing. Ranger came over and licked my face. I wrapped my arms around his neck and buried my face in his fur. I closed my eyes. I was in the lake again, but I also wasn't. The darkness surrounded me, but the darkness of Ranger's fur, the warmth of his body was also there. I held on to it, entangling my fingers in his fur, rooting myself as I was able to look at my surroundings in both places at once. I heard them calling me, but this time I did not obey. I opened my eyes back in my house. I ran after Joanna, who I found in the dining room with Drew, assembling the bucket and torches on the table. I did it! Finally, she spat. Now do it again! I spent the rest of the night practicing, first holding on to Ranger, and then just sitting alone without using him as an anchor. I was even able to fall asleep without trying to get up. I'm ready. I'm going to finish this tonight. If it works, I'll update you tomorrow. If it doesn't, this will be my last update. Well, I'm here, obviously, and it's over, more or less. This will be my final update. Here's what happened. It was just past midnight. We got into the Subaru and made our way toward the lake. I didn't want to be there. I would have paid my life savings to be anywhere else. I could just hop on a plane, go to New Zealand. How long would it take them to cross half the earth? But no, I had to do this. Out the window, I searched the tree line for skeletal figures. Somehow I knew they were there. Halfway down the hill, I saw the first glimpse of one, pale eyes gleaming from the shadows beside the road. The head turned, watching us drive by. I looked back and saw it step into the road behind us, stride long, loping, jaw flexing. It wasn't chasing us exactly, more like keeping an eye on us, calculating our next move. Drew gripped the steering wheel hard, knuckles white. Pay them no mind, Joanna said from the back seat. For our first stop, we drove past the police taped gate, stopping around the corner. Per Joanna's instructions, Drew got out. We drew a torch mounted on a long stick from the trunk. We drew a lighter from his pocket and ignited it. Maybe we should all go? I suggested. No, Joanna said flatly. He goes. We stay here. She handed him the empty, white plastic bucket out the open window on my side of the car. I kissed him and told him to be careful. He nodded, pale-faced, and said he loved me. Joanna tshed impatiently. He must have only been gone for ten minutes, but it felt like years. The moment he left, Joanna and I each lit a torch and held them out the windows. As the minutes crawled by, pairs of pale orbs began to appear amid the trees on either side of the road. One, two, four now. How many are there? I asked. In all, I mean. I don't know, she said. Fewer than there used to be. We sat in silence a few minutes before the light of Drew's torch shone from around the bend, the sight flooding me with relief. He passed the bucket, filled with lake water threw the window to Joanna and handed me his torch. Did you see any? I asked anxiously. He nodded, his expression grim. Two, but they stayed in the water and didn't come close. I could just see their eyes above the water, watching me. We didn't have far to go back up to the gate, so I simply held the two small torches out the window in one hand. It didn't matter if they went out. We had more, and they wouldn't be too hard to relight. The dancing flames were a small comfort in the cold, dark night. I squeezed Drew's hand with my free hand, and he squeezed mine back. We parked on the side of the road beside the gate, turned the car off and climbed out. We opened the trunk, and a few moments later, Joanna and Drew each had a staff torch, and I gripped a fresh handheld one in one hand, the bucket of lake water in the other. The weight of the water bucket made the handle cut into my fingers uncomfortably. I felt so, so small. Are you ready? Joanna asked. I nearly shook my head. Thought better of it and nodded. My ears rang. I wondered for a moment if I would simply faint. I could go instead, Drew said, voice shaky. No, Joanna said. It has to be her. And there's no other way? No. Drew kissed my forehead, then pulled me into a tight, one-armed hug. I leaned against him. You've got this, love, he said. When we parted, Joanna gripped my shoulder tightly, almost painfully, and looked me hard in the eye. When you were settled... No matter what you hear or sense around you, do not open your eyes. I nodded again. Do not open your eyes. I won't. I turned toward the gate. 
Right on cue, a blood-chilling scream tore through the night. It was the woman's voice, the one I had heard from the mouth of the bent, elder-looking lurcher I had been calling Pharynx on that first evening up the hill. The voice begged, sobbed, shrieked in agony. I shuddered and glanced at Joanna. Her jaw was tight, free hand clenched and a fist by her side. Go, she ordered without looking at me. I met Drew's eyes one more time and gave it what I hoped was an encouraging smile, but probably looked more like the nausea welling up in me. Once again, I squeezed past the gate. I made my way up the hill, now dry leaves crunching under my boots. I walked slowly and deliberately, praying my usual gracelessness wouldn't send me sprawling, losing me my water or igniting the whole damned forest. The flickering golden light from the torch accompanied me in a warm orb, but after a moment, I became keenly aware of a rustle of leaves and recognized the lurcher's uneven gait. I kept my gaze straight ahead, but I knew they were approaching up the drop-off to my left. The hill before me began to steepen, climbing more sharply upward. This was where the stairs had been, I realized. The lurchers seemed to suspect I was up to something. Not so easy to get to them this time. The soles of my feet ached, still healing from my Friday night somnambulance, but Joanna had smeared them with an unpleasant smelling balm that eased the pain. Three steps up, my toe slipped, and I gasped as I fell hard onto one knee. A bit of water sloshed out of the bucket, and I had to stop myself from breaking my fall with the torch-bearing hand. I rose painstakingly, finding my footing once again, and kept climbing around the curving incline to the crest of the hill. I reached the clearing, and found myself looking across it at Pharynx. From the tree line opposite me, his dead eyes met mine with blank, predatory hunger, his mouth gaping as ever, jaw dangling like a snapped limb. The depths of his macabre gullet glistening in the flickering torchlight, its ribcage expanding and contracting with each hoarse breath. I can't quite explain how, because its gaunt expression did not change, but something about its posture also seemed wary, hesitant. Maybe it was just that the lurcher wasn't actively staggering toward me. Over each of its shoulders peered two others, and as I regarded them, I knew the others were closing in from the left. No going back now. The soft rattling surrounded me on all sides, just beyond the glow of the torch. They did not scream. I was trembling. My breath came in shallow, terrified bursts that blossomed into clouds. I could feel sweat standing out on my brow despite the chill night air. It was time to make my move. I took a steadying breath, stood up taller than I felt, stepped into the center of the clearing, and set down the bucket of water in front of me. My heart beat faster. I didn't want to do this. I couldn't. I had to. I plunged the torch into the bucket of water, the frigid water chilling my hand up to the wrist as I let go of the bundle. Darkness crashed down around me, and immediately the rattling crescendo to a triumphant, deafening screech. Human screams bursting from all sides to mingle together in a gruesome, grating clamor. They were coming for me, and fast. They were just steps away. No time to think about it. Don't freeze up. As quickly as I could, I sat down, crossed my legs, closed my eyes, and released my awareness. My mind slipped back into the lake. Doing this on command, getting to the point where I could do it even with distractions, took dozens and dozens of attempts over the previous day and a half. Joanna had made me practice while she was playing music, screaming in my ear, poking me in the ribcage, whacking me with a broom, slapping my cheeks, until I could do it and remain under, no matter what was happening around me. Inky blackness surrounded me once again. I drifted in the endless dark, the pressing silence. It was almost peaceful here. Dimly, I became aware of distant sounds. I focused my hearing, not through my physical ears, but through my awareness in the water. The sounds were indeed the rattling, snarling, shrieking creatures that surrounded me, recognizable yet muffled, far away. It increased in volume, but Joanna had told me they would not touch me. I believed her. I had no choice. Suddenly, piercingly, a scream lanced through the silent waters, clear and close as a lightning strike. It was a scream I had heard before, the woman the one that tore from Pharynx's throat as it struggled to devour me, to rip into me in the woods on that first terrible day. The cry of pain ripped out of her, cut off by the gut-wrenching ripping and tearing and wet sucking, gulping of flesh and blood. She gasped, uttered a sharp reverberating shriek that devolved into guttering, hitching sobs. Even in the lake I could hear it, crystal clear, and the connection dragged me partially back to my physical body. I became aware that every hair was standing on end, every nerve ablaze, my heart hammering. I nearly opened my eyes, but Joanna said not to under any circumstances, to keep myself immersed in the lake, so that's what I did. I squeezed them tight, 
breathed deeply through my nose, concentrating on my diaphragm, and sank back into the darkness. Do not force it, she had advised. Relinquish your awareness of your physical experience. They have already called you to the water. You just need to let yourself see it. I focused on the water, tiny particles drifting through the blackness. I could still hear that hideous cry, that ghastly crunch and tear of human flesh. I tried not to listen. I so badly wanted to help her. I knew I could do nothing. It wasn't happening here and now, I told myself. It had already happened. It was over. A tear squeezed from one tightly closed eye. The screams fell silent. Everything fell silent. Then a great rustle of leaves. Long, loping, lurching, staggering feet all around me, moving eastward across the forest floor, back toward the lake. Dragging, dragging, dragging. As the sound faded, another sort of oppressive silence lifted. I heard insects and birds again. I breathed deeply and suddenly I was unburdened. I opened my eyes. The bucket was there, the extinguished torch floating on the water's surface. The clearing was empty. The leaves were a tumult around me, churned into chaos by long, emaciated feet. It was dark, very dark, only illuminated by a sliver of crescent moon in the sky. But I saw sea wetness on the leaves. Lake water, I thought to myself, but I feared something else. It was darker than water. I couldn't look at it long. I didn't want to. I got to my feet and went back down the hill, somehow unconcerned about the lurchers pursuing me. Drew was there, waiting for me, his torch still alight. I ran to him, held him tightly. He returned the embrace, one-armed. He could feel the relief too, I was sure. I pulled back. Where's Joanna? I asked, looking up at him. His brow furrowed. She's not still up there? Up where? But I knew the answer. She followed you up the hill, he said. Just a few minutes after you. She told me not to leave this spot under any circumstances. I remembered the scream, the ripping and tearing. No, 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 no. We have to drive down to the lake, I said urgently. What? Why? Please, now. As he produced the keys, I snatched them from his hand and took the driver's seat. I floored it down the hill. We screeched to a stop by the big estate, the same one where I was cornered against the shore just a few nights prior. There they were, striding into the lake. Seven in all wading through the shallows, rippling the glassy surface. One of them, pharynx, turned to regard me. It stood up to its calves in the water. Its hands hung close to the surface, glistening to the elbows, dark and slick in the moonlight. More dark wetness smeared its face between its eyes. What did you do with her? I screamed at it. It turned back to look ahead of it at two that were walking in tandem, Tantalus and another, pulling something along behind them, something that floated horribly still on the surface of the water. Gray hair drifted like moonlight in the blackness. I dropped to the grass, eyes streaming. Pharynx glanced back once more before continuing on, and they all descended, curiously graceful as they made their way into the depths, the floating thing sliding down beneath the surface with the rest of them. The crests of two heads remained, blank eyes gleaming above the water for just a moment before they slid into the black. After we returned to our house, it was another sleepless night, my mind racked with misery and guilt rather than fear. I almost longed for the fear to return. It was better than this. I replayed every moment I had with Joanna in my mind. I did this. I let her do this. She said it would happen again next year. Would it be someone else next time? I would know, and do nothing to stop it except hide in my house behind my fire like all the other neighbors. All the other neighbors. I sat up. They know about this. Beth. Beth knows about Joanna. As soon as the sun came up, I was hammering on her door. You do Joanna, I said, unapologetic about her bleary, bed-disheveled appearance. At Joanna's name, her brows flew up. Ah, she said. Yes, I mentioned your situation to her. I take it she, uh, stepped in for you? I blinked. Wait, how do you... She, you know, stepped in for John a few years ago, too, when we first moved here. Beth said. John is her husband, whom I see less often and who I assumed was still sleeping. My mind reeled. This has happened before? So you mean that she... Yes, Beth interrupted, clearly not interested in letting me say what actually happened. She shuddered, folding her arms. It was awful. But don't worry about her too much. Beth continued after a moment. It's not really your fault. I'm still not sure I agree. 
But I asked, has she done this for other people too? Beth nodded. I don't know how many, though. Best not to talk about it too much. Joanna's clenched fists before I went up the hill. Her references to others who have learned. Her words echoed in my mind. Every year they come back, and will until they deem the price has been paid for their ruined earth. She'll be back, Beth said. I spent the rest of the day at my tiny local library, digging in the archives. After six hours, I found some materials I believe to be related. A newspaper clipping of someone called Joe, a widow in her early 70s who was reported missing in late October of 1947. The clipping said her former husband, Thomas, had also been reported missing, but 19 years prior in 1928. Just weeks after the lake was declared complete. Same month. He was declared drowned after he, or some of him, turned up in the lake. He had worked on the Candlewood Project, relocating corpses from the Jerusalem graveyard. After his death, Joe became a recluse, living alone in their cabin on a dirt road atop a hill near the lake. She was said to visit select neighbors and linger by the lake in autumn. Before her disappearance, Joe had gained a reputation among more superstitious residents as an occult figure. A quote in the clipping speculated she had simply walked into the lake of her own accord. Another quote, this one from a man named Edward Brown, read, Good riddance to that old witch. I also found a reference to a Henry Brown, a boy of 12, drowning in the lake in an article published three years later. Edward's son, perhaps. Not everyone is as lucky as you, Joanna had told me. I don't always get to them in time. I found more recent accounts of attempts to raise a decrepit cabin in the neighborhood. Attempts that were thwarted by nearby locals who said it was historically important to them, but would neither go near it nor approve repairs. So, if you're ever near Candlewood Lake in late October, keep your fire lit. Stay away from the water after dark, and don't follow the voices in the woods. And if you see a grouchy little old lady walking around with what looks like a fanny pack, do whatever she says. As for me, I'm hoping you won't see her. Not just for your own well-being, but because I'm getting to work. The way I see it, I have just under one year to figure out how to break the cycle and make sure no one, not even Joanna, has to go through this again. Close thread. And that was a story about the Lurchers by Jess Safaris. Quite a quite a long one. Definitely with the uh, the longest Twitter score story that we've uh, we've covered. It was uh, I, I mean I, I enjoyed it. I, I wish I had a little bit more pictures and videos personally, you know. But um, it just, yeah, I just felt it drag just just a little bit. Otherwise, otherwise I thought it was cool. I thought it was very 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 spooks. Very very perfect for like a Halloween thing. Even though this is. Uh, Christmas Day, so it's it's like a present for all you um all you macabre bastards out there, just like me. Well, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays for those of you who don't celebrate. Um, we'll see you for the next one. You take care.